No, it's not a... <laughs> All right. No, it's not a... Okay. We are online and that uh, Miss Amanda Kremlin or Marcus is not with us. So, Alyssa... <laughs> Oh, gosh, I wasn't prepared. Hi, guys. My name is Alyssa Haber. I'm a PA with Inspired Spine, and welcome to our podcast. Today, we are going to kind of talk about the last year we've had here, our New Year's resolutions, and kind of the pros and cons of what we've been learning about and what we've learned from our patients over the last year. So, I'm Dr. Abbasi for Essence, and it's going to be a year in review. And I'm Dominic Moore. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want to know? I'm Dominic Moore. Well, I can tell you right now. It sells itself. <laughs> one thing has changed for us over the last year, and that is Dominic. So, Dominic, tell us in the last about three and a half months, three months, what has been the biggest thing you've noticed about us and Inspired Spine that you've been really excited about? Oh, okay. Okay. That's kind of nice. So for me, it's been the entirety of the year. You know, I graduated and then I came over and I had the whole interview process. And the first thing I'll start with is what really stuck out with me over here is that everybody who works here is not only competent at what they do, but they're, they're driven. They're not here to just kind of, all right, I'm going to work my 40 hours. I'm going to get the money and I'm going to go home. It's more of a, okay, Let's do this thing that we know works better that a lot of other people aren't doing because, you know, they're used to whatever they're doing and they'd rather just do old ways stuff that doesn't happen to have better outcomes, takes longer, all that other good stuff. And it's just it's nice and refreshing to find a place that cares about innovation and patient care and not one or the other, because that you feel like that's a lot of the, what I end up seeing. You either have these places that no matter the risk, we're going to try something new because it's going to make us more money. Mm. Or, ah, man, I don't want to touch that new thing. I've been doing this thing for 20 years. Like, why would I even try something else? Mm -hmm. So th that was great A for me when I came over here. And believe it or not, you guys held up. It wasn't just for the interview. You keep doing it. <laughs> That's true. We weren't lying when we told you, you know, ready or not, we, we don't stop when it comes to the world of medicine. And Dr. Bossi can attest to that. Yeah, but you know, uh, and uh, I think there's a reason they call us provider. We mm -hmm. provide care. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, most of the time, people get into medicine because of the name, because of the money and so on. And then we are surprised why there's so many burns out in medicine because providing mm -hmm. care, it takes everything from you. It takes double back. If you are open to receive, like, um, um, I think, now if I had a tear in my eyes, it would be shed last week when we took care of that patient, okay? Mm -hmm. Because when he left us, this is a grown man, start crying, being emotional, say, you know, you guys are so nice. And um, I didn't expect this. He was feeling that we are in it for it. But, you know, but that was a really, I think I would in any category was emotional care that we provided. Well, um, I, I want you to give your experience because that really summarize who we are and what we do. Do you want to tell your experience, what you observed? Don't even interpret it. Just tell us, both of you, um, you start on me, tell us your observation about that uh, that uh, patient that we did last week in our surgery center. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'll give uh, some quick notes on it because I actually just talked to him yesterday too. So I'm pretty updated on him. Um, but I had talked to him before surgery and he was the kind of guy who had been getting his surgery pushed back and pushed back because insurance wouldn't approve it. And he even mentioned that when he finally got his court date and got to stand before a judge, there had been several other cases very similar to his that the judge just kind of was incredulous on going, how, why is this here today? Why, why is any of this getting backed up? You guys need this and, you know, approve, 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 approve. And so that just to start it all off. And, but then he's also in, incredible pain but you would never really know it 
just talking to him because I swear on God's green earth, I've never seen an angel without wings, but there he is. Uh, <laughs> that man was so sweet. He has and he has, He's a farmer. Yeah, it, it's just, oh. you know, the salt of the earth kind of guy. Very, very simple. Like, and just every word out of his mouth was just so kind and so polite. And then come day of surgery, he, he comes in and he just... He, such a such a broken man but only only in body never in spirit and when you see him come in and then he goes under anesthesia and then we finally take it back to the or and he's just so so covered in filth and talking to this guy you know he's not the kind of guy either that wants to be this way he's not a dirty man not not in the slightest it's just this is the kind of quality of life that he has to have and he'll tell you up and down oh family's taking care of me they're doing a great job they're doing amazing care for me and this is what he's getting it's to the point where not only is there dirt there's dead bugs and that that is just heartbreaking because yeah. look nobody deserves that but least of all this guy absolutely yeah. not this man yeah and, and so and that is the price of not being able to walk Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. not being able to walk. Um, Alyssa, tell me your observation about that patient. Yeah, I, I'm. I mean, I stand by what Dominic says, hundred percent. Of course, nobody deserves to be in that same situation. But sadly, we have we have patients, we have people living every day in these situations, and it takes a toll on on your body, not only physically, mentally, emotionally, but like we described, suddenly when you can't walk or you can't move, or you're in so much pain that you just physically don't want to do these things anymore, then you are you become reliant on other people. And for people like myself, and I got to imagine this man being a farmer, very independent, strong, it's tough to suddenly be, oh man, I'm going to walk outside and grab the mail to, I can't even walk to the bathroom by myself anymore. And to see that that transition from independent to slowly becoming more dependent and the effect it has on you from an emotional standpoint and a mental standpoint, um, Dominic nailed it on the head. You know, he was so motivated and ready to get his life back and he wanted to do all of these things. He was put in a position where he physically could not do that anymore. He was to the point where he was not able to ambulate and then we know kind of what happens once you stop being able to walk. You know, you start having those other issues that come with it from a, a physical health side of things, not just a spine side of things. And then, of course, those little things such as, you know, hygiene, making money, going out and playing with your dog, all those things that, you know, he was once able to do just slowly progress. And we were able to see that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's heartbreaking yeah. for sure. And these things are not theoretical. You no. guys observe that. Mm -hmm. What is the price of not providing care or not being able to receive a care, no matter what the reason is? Mm -hmm. his care, in his situation, part of that was that evil insurance thing. But part of that was as well, he had a problem that very few people could help him. And we see that all the time. We see that all the time that people come to us when we tell them, we can take care of you. They they tear up. They mm -hmm. just their that, that that little bit of a hope that we can give them. That really you see that in their face. And I saw him nine months before. He was really he was a broken man. He was deconditioned. He could not stand. He could not walk. He he was a he's the hardest working man I know. He had a broken back many years ago. He has been working through his life with a broken back where some of us would have, you know, taken the whole life off. Mm -hmm. Hardest working person. And now when I saw him, I could not imagine, you know, how just in, what, seven, eight months, how far down the hill he has gone, come. Obviously, he has been just sitting there and eating. He has gained weight. He couldn't. He barely could do anything. He hasn't probably taken a shower for a long time. But you know what? You guys are too young to understand that. Sometimes I have back pain. It takes me 15 minutes to stand up from a couch. It took me literally 15 minutes to get in and out of the car. 15 minutes. And I'm not 
exaggerating. So I can sympathize with that. And he is not a not just a dirty man, as the mm -hmm. topic was saying, but when when you are in a situation, everything is a struggle, and then all of a sudden you have dead bugs in you because you cannot take care of yourself. This is a price of one of my colleagues telling to their patient, there is nothing I can do for you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now in his situation was a combination of things, but there are many of these patients, we tell to the patient, you know, the surgery is too risky, but in back of our mind is, it is too risky for Hamid Abbas's practice. Get out of my sight. I don't want to see you because you are a danger to my practice because some of my colleagues, some of the hospitals, they're just waiting for me to do something wrong for you. And then I will be paying. My practice is going to pay the price of trying to take care of you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is real. This is real. And that pushes many of our spine surgeons. Now, having said that, it is true that in the traditional surgery, the risks are so much higher that trying to take care of a patient like him, he was like 350 per, uh, pound patient. Uh, mm -hmm. the, he puts the medical technology at the limit. And that's what I'm proud of, that our, we have refined our technology that all of a sudden, these things are doable things. But now they go to somebody else who does, does traditional surgeries and they the only answer to them is get out of my practice. Or lose weight. I mean, that that's something that I wanted to <laughs> yeah. talk about with this this individual is you, you had mentioned, you know, a high BMI, high infection, you know, he has all of these possible complications. Well, then you, you have this man who you have been trying to rehab, you've been trying to get that strength back, but clearly we have seen the progression of weakness. He is, his nerves are impinged to the point where his muscles are failing him at this point. How does one lose weight when they physically are not able to move? Now, I'm not saying it's not possible. There are a lot of ways to be able to lose the weight, but you have to understand how much more difficult that is for somebody that cannot walk, cannot move. It takes a lot of arm exercises to make up for walking a couple of miles. Yeah. I'm just going to put it lightly. And then you sit mm. somebody in a wheelchair who can't walk and you say, well, you need to lose a hundred pounds. Yeah. The, the amount of stress that could put somebody under when you say, this is my only option. I can't do that. What, what's the point? Yeah. And, and then you get, you know, and you gain more weight typically. Yeah. And I put sometimes these uh, testimonials and these cases on LinkedIn. Some of our Sunni colleagues come back and say, you should never do that surgery. Mm -hmm. They should go and lose weight. And when I tell them, this is at the end of the road and they cannot do that. They have tried. They, and they come back and say, how hard is it to lose weight? It's not a rocket science. I'm mm -hmm. not a violent person, but I get the urge to punch somebody in the face. <laughs> then they come back and say, they try to shame the patient. That is your fault, more with different words. It is your fault. You, in a way, you deserve to suffer. That is mm -hmm. so lack, this lack of empathy is infuriating to me because we I, I'm trying to lose weight. I know how hard it is. And I know there are some people are genetically there. You won't believe how much of that is genetic to lose weight. Some people, they can eat everything they want. They don't gain weight. I just need to look at water. I gain weight. I, I feel that one. Yeah. But so you understand how hard it is now take us from a normal situation in a situation that we cannot walk, we cannot do anything. The only joy is left is that whole moment that you put a food in your mouth. The reality mm -hmm. is they tell them, go lose weight. They come back, gain weight, and then the, the condition, then even if you look at, the, look at it at the financial region, we had this conversation with the 
chief medical officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield a few years ago, he was saying, you know, yeah, they done the condition two years later, one year later, you have to pay for $700,000 triple bypass heart surgery for them mm. because they have deconditioned now. And then I, and I, there is a statistic that's scary. Mm. About 80 to 90% of the money that is spent on Medicare is spent on the last few months of life. I believe that. That is amazing how we are bankrupting our healthcare by putting the patient in a situation that they decondition, they cannot do anything. Now, you can imagine the patient that we saw last week, mm -hmm. he wasn't far away from having a cardiopulmonary collapse and die. Oh he saw mm -hmm. in, in, in his folds of his body, there were dead bugs. He, mm -hmm. could, he barely could do anything before without panting and having hard of uh, you know breathing he wasn't far away to collapse cardiopulmonary because he was deconditioned mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now <laughs> dominic you were in that surgery what did you observe about our surgery what did we do well honestly the the thing that was the most impressive to me was how quick it was for a surgery that apparently would have been just absolutely impossible nobody could do it you know this guy the risk is so much higher than anything else and then he's in and out just like that in a you know? surgery center in the surgery center that's something that uh people need to also understand that as equipped as these surgery centers are they are amazing they are another step to be able to give these patients an outcome without having to make them go into a hospital system, stay for ample amount of days, have that care, mm -hmm. you know, when they could be in, in and out surgery, even someone that has such a high BMI, we were able to have technically an in and out day of surgery. Yeah. We're and talking yes. crazy miraculous things. Yeah. And you know that the, what, what I'm really proud of that, that everybody can do that. It's not like I have offered all my competitors in town to come and teach them that. Mm -hmm. There is another patient, we are not going to say names, who was supposed to get a certain kind of surgery in the, in the, in the university. She goes there mm -hmm. and uh, she says, yeah, my doctor, a boss, he told me I'm, it's going to be one and a half hour surgery. The anesthesiologist tell her, what do you know what the anesthesiologist told her? I told her she's crazy. She said, no, no, no. This is an eight to 12 hour surgery. Mm -hmm. We end up doing that surgery in a smaller place and it was one hour and 16 minutes and we lost 50 cc of blood. Patient was discharged two days later and sent us all those nice letters and fruit basket and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And another great example of when other people try to tell us stuff that we know better about you know it's the insurance companies <laughs> these other things that are saying you don't know what you're talking about it's like really have you read our papers have you looked at our history <laughs> where does where when's the last time you've done an eight hour case dr Abbasi? let alone on a lumbar fusion yeah you well know? you have the data right that neuropro the program yeah. that i wrote mm -hmm. that's so emotional about the data we have over 8,000 patients, over 2,000 OLIF, over 40,000 follow-ups. Mm -hmm. And that is based on data. We know what we are doing. And do you, can you see my frustration when I get to some of these people and say, look at the data. They say, I have no interest in your data. They say that. They say, mm -hmm. I'm too busy to look at data. No wonder you are busy. You're doing a so eight, hour hour case. eight hours no wonder you have no time you're busy but then the you know that the, the, the frustration that we try to teach it to the rest of the world and then you see what is the consequences of not providing this care to elderly to high bmi patient if there is any resolution for 2024 is that i will double my effort to give this care to the patient. This is this is my resolution. Because when you see that, I mean, at, certainly everybody has its own motivation. 
But what could be a bigger motivation that four hours after that surgery, the patient says, after six months, I can't feel my leg with tear in his eye. <laughs> and camera says, I can't. What could be a bigger motivation than that? <laughs> and Dominic, he was uh, seeing some patients with me this morning, and we I had an example for him right away. Already, we had a six month post op from a L two to S one. You know, so this is this is no joke of a surgery. And he just looks at me and he's like, you know, I'm happy. Thank you guys. You know, I couldn't ask for anything more. You know, he's up and walking and doing things, and you know, I just look at him and say, you know, thanks for coming in and seeing us. And he's <laughs> No, thank you guys. You know, there's nothing more that I could have done at that other, you know, I just smile, say, are you doing everything I'm asking you to do? And yeah. he's just glowing, you know, just so happy. Mm -hmm. I told Dominic, I said, this, this is what makes me keep going. I said, it doesn't matter about the three patients that weren't as nice as this guy before. It was this guy that kept me going, you know, and I'm still smiling at one o'clock, ready to keep going for the rest of my day. And I can genuinely say that it's those patients, it's those post-ops, it's those smiles afterwards because no one's smiling before surgery, no one's smiling mm -hmm. in pain when they're, you know, getting told no, that it's makes, after, it's that after. Makes provider. That mm -hmm. makes you a provider, you're providing care and those patients, and there are more than ever, you know, People do appreciate us. And that's one of the things that makes me, it's a lot, it's really stressful for me to go to Kansas. I have to go Sunday, I have no Sunday, I have no, I have no weekends anyway, but I go there instead of doing my research. Then I arrive at midnight, then drive an hour, I wake up at six, and then I do 14 hour clinic day and surgery and so on and so forth. But they are really appreciative patients. And that makes it really worse for me that I see. I am changing people's life. As we go, we are changing history of spine surgery and spine is not a small thing. 1.62 million spinal fusions are performed in the United States annually. And this is number one reason for disability. And we know what that means, being disabled, mm -hmm. truly disabled to a point that bugs live in your body. Mm -hmm. okay? You can change those lives. And that is something worth keep doing and doing and doing. So my resolution for next year is no matter the cynic, no matter the naysayers, we are going to give this care to more and more people. And we are going to medical, make medical history. We are at the verge of uh, you know, changing the face of yesterday. I got a, a, a text from one of our colleagues in India after I was there just a few months ago. No, they are doing this. He sent me a testimonials of the patient and pictures and so on. I'm going to put it on LinkedIn. And what's important there is that, you know, you guys know that I always take testimonials and I have, we have over 1,200 patient testimonials. But people don't know how busy I am. No, they do not. They <laughs> don't understand that when I go to clinic, I take care of the patient. And I'm lucky if I get a bathroom break. Why do I take time to, in that busy day, to take a patient testimonials? Why, why do I do that, Dominic? Why, uh, two months into this, I start taking patient testimonials. Not that that's really what matters. What patient feel mm. say, but yes, not many surgeons do that, right? Um, mm -mm. No, and I'm <laughs> not, not, at all. not killing time. I'm, I have a lot of other things to do. So Not saving time. <laughs> why do I do that, though, Dominic? Why do I take my time, take patient testimonial? Why do I tell you, take your time, take patient testimonials? Why do we do that? Because it's important to know what the patient thinks about it. Because you can give people data all they want, all that sort of stuff. You can show them how fast it is. You can show them the efficacy rates and all that stuff. But a person who sits there, like the man from last week, who mm -hmm. says over the phone, I have never been this good in so many years. I thought I was going to die like because of this. To now he's having tea with his neighbor and telling her, hey, Meryl, you got to get this back taken care of. I know just the people. Like, <laughs> That's that's you know that's not in the data. Like the data is so important, but this that's the only way that you get yeah. that. Really and that is. is in a surgery that other people say it's eight hours, 
50% risk of infection. Uh, but the, 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 half of the cases, you have to blood transfuse, you have to spend in the ICU and so on, and we do it in a surgery center and so on. So you see, if you go tell people, the surgery uh, you do in eight hours, we do in one and a half hour and send the patient home a few hours later with 50 cc of blood loss, they're going to come with everything they can say, you know, why you are wrong. You're a lawyer, you don't believe you, and so on. So Carl Zegan is one of my heroes. He's a, a, the person who was in NASA, did that, uh, did lots of our Voyager that, uh, flights. He was the, the, the director of that. He said something, he has a series everybody should watch, it's called Cosmos. And uh, he said something that, to affect that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that's what it is. 1,200 patients getting in front of the camera say, I do want to share my experience with you. I want my story to be told. They told me I will die. They told me there is no chance. They told me I cannot have the surgery. Yet, we did that surgery. Now, I can walk. Now, my kids have to call, make sure I'm at home before they come and see me. Before that, they had to take turn to take time off to just care for me. Now, they have to call, make sure that I'm not doing something fun without them so that I'm home when they come. Okay? And, you know, and that is at the end of the day, what really matters, and you're absolutely right, that is not captured in those cold data of the research, but we do capture them, right? Mm -hmm. we, you know, that, uh, I, I'm that, that, uh, as anal and uh, obsessive compulsive I am, I'm double checking on everybody. <laughs> and once in a while I send those emails, <laughs> this is not right. Who did capture that data? So, so we do our <laughs> academic work nevertheless. And I was going to say, too, I know Dr. Abbasi has gotten a few personal text messages himself, but I, I myself, PA is here. We do a lot of our post-op um, care, it's meaning I get a lot of patients who come into my office, you know, one month out, three months out, you know, not too long, and they're showing me pictures. They're just scrolling through. Alyssa, look, this is me at my garden. Alyssa, look, this is me on my motorcycle. You told me not to ride it, but I was able to ride it, and I only did it for five minutes. Don't yell at me. You okay, know? send them to me. It's send the them little, to us. It's the, little, it's, the, it's the little things like that, you know, or Dr. Bossy sends me a picture. He goes, look, this is the guy from last week, and he's chainsawing down a tree or something, you know. <laughs> it's, it's those little things that, you know. You don't see those in the testimonials. And I'm not over here saying, hey, look, Mr. Larry's chopping down trees. But they, they send that to us because we truly tell them, hey, our goal is to get you that quality of life back. You know, what are things you weren't able to do? Like, let's talk about expectations. And then we get done with surgery. And they're just like, hey, you told me I was going to be chopping down trees. Look at me. Here I am. You are right. You know, those are those little things. I wasn't trying to be right. I wanted to, I knew I was right. I knew I had the ability. You have to believe it. You have to buy into it. And that that's one of the most beautiful things is, you know, people don't see that. And we can try and express this to people until they truly have that awakening of, oh my gosh. That is fulfilling. I can do something again. You know, it, it's beautiful. People love beautiful. to share that with us too. Yeah. I love to see it. <laughs> but every time they do that, send it to me. Probably I have a bad day. Something like that makes my day. Oh yeah, hundred percent does. But but you know, we still we are in a situation that, you know, um, to be honest, everybody, the, 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 the patient, they love us. They know what we do and so on. They send their family to us. But what we are doing is, uh, some people give us a hard time. You guys know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Why do you think? That, uh, that what we are doing is not, why not everybody does what we do? Sometimes patients ask us, tell me, why do you think what not, why not everybody does what we do? It's, I, a lot of the times I feel like it's not malicious. You certainly get those cases where sometimes it is, but I think sometimes people are just so hesitant to change. They say, listen, I, this is, I've been eating cheeseburgers and French fries my entire life. Why would I ever try a filet mignon? No, no thanks, man. I'm good. And it's just, you, you know, they, they think it works the way they have it. Why change the system? Even yeah. if it's better, like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't want to try it. So 
They just I, don't have the passion to change. I get that question all the time. They're like, what do you mean there's only 30 spine surgeons that do this? I, I say exactly that. Because Dr. Bassi, I could ask him again, how much schooling did you go through to get to just the neurosurgery spine fellowship itself? With all the traditional yeah. surgeries, with all the traditional stuff that they have to have research on and make textbooks and make professors and make all those advancements to teach in the general schooling. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, yeah, yeah, this, this is something that our surgeons went above and beyond. Mm -hmm. They're not teaching this in classrooms. This is extra schooling. This is extra education, extra procedural. This is all them putting into medicine, into the future, into you guys. And they mm -hmm. look at me and they're just like, what, you're telling me they went through 10 plus years of college and fellowships plus going in and creating new techniques and new surgeries. And I'm sitting here like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me how many special people it takes to truly, like you said, give up your weekends and it's not just your weekends to develop this. Yeah, yeah. Now, the joke is that, you know, I have lots of uh, letter attached to my name, MPPHD, <laughs> AANS and FACS, each of those letters, each of them took me three years. Yep. I think they're actually longer than your name is. I, I think it all is. of the letters that come after your name are longer than your entire name. But you know, people think, you know, you stop living, you educate yourself, and then you are somewhere, then you start living again. No, that is, if you take it that way, that is horrible. Like after mm -hmm. the high school, 23 years, I was 40 years old before I was a done neurosurgeon, but I wasn't done even. I wasn't even board certified. I had to gather my cases for three years, submit them, go get, take another exam. Then I was board certified 26 years. Mm -hmm. But if you take that, oh God, you have to stop 26 years, just uh, train and then you're done. Then it sounds like much, but if you say 26 years will pass one way or another, I want to be better every single year of it. Then all of a sudden, is that 26 years, I'm better than last year. Wow, look at that. I'm better than the last year. And guess what? It has not stopped. It has not stopped. And it's not going to stop. I have no <laughs> faith in saying that. You know, some people say, I quit working two days before I die. The reality is they, that no. I... I quit working three days after I die. And not even that. <laughs> I have full faith that the day that happens, which I will not talk into existence, that the legacy will last a lot longer than three and, days. You know, and that is truly I'm proud of, you know, that yeah. I'm, I'm proud of every time you guys do something spectacular, I see how you're talking to the patient, how you read the picture right, how to your plan is so sound. That is, that's happiness for me. That's bliss. That is like a father watching his children hitting milestone after the milestone. But one of the, the thing is I'm true to that is that, yes, I do a four level fusion in one and a half hour that nobody on the planet can do. But that's not what I'm proud of. I'm proud that I can teach that to anybody, any surgeon to get at that level in one tenth of the number of the experience that I needed to get there. Like if people need 700, if I needed 700 cases to be good at 45 degrees scoliosis, people hit those milestones after 70, 100 cases because they can add to my experience. I have made a curriculum they can do that. I am truly proud of that, that other people can get there faster and spread the knowledge and the expertise there, it takes a lot of time. It, it is one thing to be good at something, but it is yet another level of being able to create a curriculum. You know, you have heard, you learn truly things once you start teaching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing yes. is closer to the truth. Nothing is uh, along the truth more than, than the thing that you have to know. You Like, imagine you speak English, right? It comes effortlessly to you. But once you start teaching somebody else English, you say, oh, wow, why do we say that this way? Why do we do it this way? What does it take? Why is that you say uh, they went 
but they, they or, or uh, he they they go, but he she goes. What what are the what are the structure behind that? Because if you start just teaching them, just memorizing things, everybody will fail, or it's a success mm -hmm. rate. But if you bring structure, what should I teach them before I teach them other things? Mm -hmm. A long time. A yep, long yeah, it's like trying to teach calculus before you know how to add and subtract. I mean, like, what? How are you going to even start? <laughs> calculator. Yeah, yeah, that is. <laughs> no, but that is who we are. We made a calculator. Though you can, we made a calculator for people who want to learn calculus, and that we we put the rules down. You know, now that you books. say that, uh, you know, at one point there was no such thing as a calculator and somebody had to bring the idea and say, hey, this thing's going to make that 17 pages of paperwork into two buttons. And everyone was like, no, we can't trust it. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I've got my abacus. I'm not going to try that. Down everything we can for five hours, you know, you know, something as simple as, oh, here's some technology. Boop, boop, boop. Done in five seconds. You know, but everybody, I guarantee you everybody was thinking you're crazy no we don't believe this we don't trust this now what i <laughs> i reportedly use a calculator virtually any chance i can yeah. um, <laughs> thank you for whoever invented the calculator and someday they're going to say the same thing about this you know thank yeah. you whoever decided to create the calculator is fine i mean and, you know and that is that part being part of history always it's going to the reward will come much much later but, uh, you know, I cannot thank you to, to be with me, part of this making history. Okay? So we are, oh, we, are making, <laughs> we are making history together. And you see the patient and uh, it is their hard days. Mm -hmm. See, you know, yeah, but uh, that, that's one of the things make us providers. We are not uh, made of sugar. When it rains, we don't melt away. When it becomes hard, that is where we shine. When everybody is panicking and running away, we are running toward. We are that those people, like you know, first line of people. When it becomes too much for others, we run toward the problem. Mm -hmm. What makes us special, different? Okay, when, when people are trying to get rid of the patient because that's too much for them, we open our arms, say, you are in the right place. That is one of the things I tell to my patient. You are in the right place. If it was easy, you wouldn't come to me. And that you, you would see their faces when they, how they open up. I say, you know, I know you told me all about who told you that you cannot be helped. I know all about that they told you there's nothing to do for you. You are in the right place. I will take care of you. Let me help you. Let me put my expertise on you. Give me time to do my homework. Mm -hmm. I, I have to convince them to go more to do more physical therapy. They are deconditioned. I want to recondition them before the surgery. You, you see that when they come to see, they, are just, they have their walls of distrust out there. They say, you know, everybody telling me they cannot help me. And this is my last try and so on. And then you gain their trust, and and then they, they sort of melt away. Then they, they 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 send you the pictures of their how they are getting on a horse, and they send you the picture of their birthday party that they can participate again and so on. Mm -hmm. They become part of your life. And I always tell mm -hmm. I nothing made me more excited than I did a post op call, and two days after surgery, this patient. First thing, first thing she says is, pain's okay. I got engaged. <laughs> and, you know, really nothing makes you more excited when they say, oh my gosh, I'm in all this pain. But the first thing I'm going to say is, oh my gosh, Alyssa, you're, gonna have, you're not going to believe this. Yeah. I finally can yeah. be excited about something for once and I'm never looking back. Like it's the, yeah. like I said, it's yeah. those relationships. They it's, want to tell you that. They don't, they don't want to talk about their pain with you. They want to talk about those personal things because you have yeah. that relationship. You see, that's why it's worth to take the risk for the patient. Mm -hmm. 
to see yeah. that. Uh, I mean, that... just on Christmas Eve, I was talking to one patient who had just had surgery to kind of see how she was doing because, you know, it's, it's the holidays and God knows nowhere else wants to do anything on those days. So I was like, hey, so how's this going? We spent probably five minutes talking about anything related to medicine. And then she was like, oh, but we just had puppies. <laughs> and cue a 30 minute conversation about that instead. Cause I mean, it's, it's Christmas Eve. What am I doing anyways? Yeah, so we just started talking. I talked about dogs that my mom has. She talked to me about her husband is not doing very well with the puppies. Cause they're so small. He's all nervous. It's, it, come so on, you, know? <laughs> you see, you become part of their life. Now in this moment, we have to as well, you know, appreciate that, you know, we, there's a bigger system that enable us to do what we are doing. We have to appreciate as well, the rest of our team, some people, they don't get all this positive reinforcement that he, we, have, we have direct contact to the patient. Um, and, uh, and admittedly, you know, we have as well difficult patient. You know, and how can you not be difficult if you have been in pain for years and everybody is uh, telling you, you they cannot do nothing for you. Everybody to try to push you out of their domain and office we have lots of patients as well that are difficult. And sometimes people who don't get all our positive feedback and have to deal with all the these hard cases and so on, mm -hmm. they're exhausted. So I'm hoping that you know some of our our team members watch this and that, they, that they, we have to tell them that we appreciate them to enable us to do what we are doing. Now um, we have been catching like wildfire. When I went to India, everybody knows us. Um, like in we started this service in Kansas, people in the entire state of Kansas talk about us. Um, and you know, the, the people drive now six days because they cannot fly. They drive six mm -hmm. days, they cannot drive, they drive like a few hundred miles, they have to stop. They are in miserable position. They can come to us so we are getting a national attention, and I want to use that national attention for a good purpose, to let the patient um, understand their choices, to understand their situation. And this podcast is part of that. You know, again, um, I didn't get into the podcast because I had extra time. What? I need for uh, I, I need our lunch break on a Friday to educate everybody out there free time. <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, this is closest I come to uh, have a meaning for my life to do something that give lots of people something they cannot get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, makes life of other people better in in any way we can. Now, um, if we are all getting close, you know, and uh, it is that Friday just before the end of the year, um, and I haven't been, uh, it was a hard year for me for many reasons, mostly because I have to fight for my patient. You guys know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. But, but um, but I haven't been up ever optimistic as I am now because I have a good team. I'm talking about two of you, two of you, and more. We have a great team. Okay? We have a great team here. And I and I I, I think it, uh, every time people have tried to do the convention breakers, game changers. We had a uh, we had a podcast about Ignaz Zemmelweis who went insane mm -hmm. because he said, "Wash your hand." So your patient don't yeah. die. The savior of mothers? He went insane? Well, yeah. he his Everyone kept saying he was crazy. It's like the calculator thing all over again. At some point, somebody had to say, wake up and wash your hands, guys. It's going to save lives. And everybody looks at you like you're insane. Stop wasting your time. Yeah. Stop guys. telling us to wash our hands. He was bullied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> no, Who would have thought? You know, no, I, I assume you know the story, Dominic, that... Mm -hmm. People would die in that hospital in Vienna if they would go to the place where the doctor would take care of them. The the the, the nurses knew that the doc the patient knew that patient would come and beg not to go to the regular hospital but to go to the um, part that the 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 practic the nuns would take care of them the midwives would take mm -hmm. care of them because doctor would go do 
autopsy, do not wash their hand, come back and take care of the patient. And up to one third to half of the woman would die after the, mm -hmm. after the delivery. And the solution was, please wash your hand. Isn't that so? You're, you are crazy, Zemel Weiss. Are you telling me, me, the gentleman, my hands would carry a disease and so on? He would. He lost his job. He lost everything. Mm -hmm. He went crazy. He would go on the street. Flyers would give flyers to the woman. Please make your doctor wash the, wash their hands and so on. He died in a mental asylum. But oh, I did know that. I you see in my head, I had made up a happy ending for him after he lost his job right. and everything. So he just saved the world. Yeah, good men should get good things, but uh, you know we live in the real world, so. He, he, his, it was no happy ending there. Mm -hmm. It took 15, 20 years before it was adopted and unimaginable number of patients died, women died, because of this arrogance of eminent doctors. He was told, and I did a TikTok about that, uh, Mr. Zemel, uh, 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 Mr. Zemelweiss, I have no place for new thoughts in my service by his chair of his department. I need obediency. If you want to keep your job, shut your mouth and don't come with crazy ideas like we should wash our hands. And he did lose his job because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But he did not have internet. He didn't have a podcast. He did not have... Dominic and Alyssa, he did not have Amanda Gremlin or Margust. <laughs> <laughs> he did not have he did not have people who helped him to go to the public, and the public didn't have the tools they have now. So I'm more optimistic than ever. It's going to be hard, but I'm more positive than ever. And Dominic, what do I tell my patients all the time? Mentality is a huge factor. So yeah. your outlook, your positivity, your mentality, you yeah. got to think positive and you're going to get better results. Yeah. So I love to hear that, Dr. Bassi. I preach it and I preach it to you all the time. And I don't care if it's faking it till you make it. <laughs> Keep your opt optimistic <laughs> mentality strong, okay? Going into 2024. That is not mumbo jumbo. Let me no, I know. You, let me tell you a true story. Okay. In, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, when we knew about these immune factors, mm -hmm. and you know what they are, mm -hmm. there are certain hormones factors in your body. If they are high, you can fight the cancer and infection better. You can heal better. If they are low, you cannot fight them. Now, they took a bunch of college people, they made a questionnaire and sort them through optimistic and pessimistic kind of people. Then they showed them, um, so the questionnaire and so on divided them into optimistic and pessimistic people. Then they showed them an open-ended short movie. At the end of the movie, it could go both ways. The couple could get together or they could, one of them could die. It could go both ways. You could interpret it in either way. It wasn't a surprise that the optimistic people thought it's going to have happy end, and the pessimistic people would say it was um, it was bad end that one of them would die. Okay, so that wasn't surprising. But then they measured the immune factors before and after. Optimistic people increased their immune value. Pessimistic people, their immune value, immune levels decreased, meaning that. If you have a healing process to work with, the optimistic people would have come out much, much better than if you're pessimistic. So your attitude toward life is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that is not a mumbo jumbo. That is not a, a, a Hindu, Buddhistic thing, <laughs> Zoom, a, 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 a karma, and so on. Placebo effect? That's well, what it is, it works, it mm -hmm. works every single time, 
So your attitude toward life shapes your future. That is what you need to know. That is why when the patient comes to me and they are neg negative, I tell them the story. I take my time. I tell them the story for that reason, that I want you to be positive, And this is why, because you will be healing so much better with a positive attitude. And that part is not a mumbo jumbo. We have clinical evidence. We have your immune factors literally are higher if you're positive, and that will increase your chance of healing and have a better result. If your immune factors are higher, you're one seventh likely you could have an infection and we know the effect of infection on you. If you have cancer, your body's fighting it. If you, if you, and that is something we know from lots of personal stories. Mm. When people, especially toward the end of their life, imagine there's a, I, have, I know many people in my life, couple, they have lived with each other for 50, 70 years. When one dies, the other one dies within weeks yeah. because they give up. They give up. They have nothing to live anymore. They give up. They will die within a week or two. So again, this is as measurable effect in your life, how you are. And that is why I, I love to have two sunshine on my team. <laughs> All these positive attitudes. Well, more than two, but I'm talking to two of them now. So <laughs> but learn that as well for your own life. Okay. Mm -hmm. You fake it until you make it. Absolutely. Every I, I say that all the time. I do not care if that is a forced <laughs> smile on your face. Yes. As long as it is a smile, you are one step ahead of everybody else here, whether you believe it or not. Just keep same, on going. Same immune factors. Go higher with the number of the smiles. Even, though if, even if you have fake smile, even mm -hmm. if you just make the face having a smile, your immune factors are going up. Mm -hmm. So no mama jumbo there. Real. It's all real. It works. Okay? Straight back from essence of you guys. Yeah. So <laughs> can we cut this out and put it short. Uh, well, uh, you guys got my New Year's resolution, but I want to hear about yours. Um, well, mine is obviously from a personal side of things, is just to continue to keep growing, to keep expanding. I mean, I've had an ex exponential growth in this last year that I mean, I'm sure Dr. Bassi has seen it and I'm sure people around me have seen it. And eventually at some point I start to see it in myself and it just mind blows it. So I can't even imagine uh, where I'm going to be at about this time next year. Um, from a from a more patient side of things, my biggest goal is to just continue to listen. That's the number one thing I hear from my patients is like, they're like, Alyssa, thank you so much for just hearing me out, just listening to me. And I know at times as you keep working, burn, like you said, burnout is real. You get tired, you get long days, long patients, hard patients. And the person, the patient right after that tough patient deserves the same amount of care and respect. And so my, my biggest goal is to just continue to not let life knock you down, not let the person before you or after you take you down to give everybody that same care that they deserve all the time. That's my goal. I, I know that people think I'm a robot and I have no um, human <laughs> in me, but I have observed you and I'm proud of you, Alyssa. I know all the I know all the demons you're fighting, and you're coming up. I I I do notice that, and you you have come a tremendous way, and you have not stopped yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank so, you, um, Dominic. Your New Year's resolution. Yeah. So mine is a little bit a mix of practical and social. Uh, I happen to be very, very blessed with my classmates being not idiots. Like a lot of people from my class are incredibly smart. And so on the one hand, you know, there's always the seeing what I can do on a personal note to kind of get the word out there. But also like they're out there in many other fields, some surgical, some not surgical, some family medicine, some endocrinology, some just urgent care, you know, everything like that. And they all love hearing about the different things that we kind of do over here, because what we learn in school is an eight to 12 hour surgery. And so every time I kind of explain it to them, you know, the first first thought they come back with is, OK, so you guys aren't 
doing spine surgery. It's like, oh no, that that's that's what it is. And so um, uh, it's just kind of explaining that a little bit more to them, getting their hands on it to actually show some, because there's some good resources online to kind of talk about it too. And I just talked to one of my friends who is now comfortable in his interventional radiology, a uh, little Ooh. residency that he's going through over there. And I think that they might like to hear about it. Well, um, and you know, I think you are going to be shaping our system with Alyssa and with the rest of the team in the next year. Mm -hmm. We are expanding to multiple states and you guys are going to be practically more and more independent and in charge. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it really warms my heart. Every Sunday at the, the, the 5 p.m. I appear there and look at the empty space and I know how much life is going on in that place. That really makes me happy. Lots of life is going on, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, um, to finish it up, I'm actually looking for um, a picture. There's a reason I'm looking for that picture. I guess we'll give you some time to look for your pictures. <laughs> no, it doesn't take long. I'm going to show it to you pretty fast. And there is a reason I'm showing it to you, this picture. I get so scared. I know you're not going to show <laughs> in your high picture of me, but no, the no. answer is, it's you know, it's no. still my first it's thought. It. No, it's not a picture of you, but I wish I would. No, that picture that you guys send it to me, making a thing in the, in the front of the surgery center. I really, I like Charlie mm. to put that picture, that, uh, that picture of the team. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the picture, I want to actually show you two pictures from my past. I don't much share things from my past because my past has lots of dark spots. It, lots of, lots of, I, I think I have a lot of demons. I come from a, my parent barely could read and write. My mother could not read and write. My father barely could read and write. And uh, we, um, it was a lot of struggle for me to get where I am. And uh, the, many of those things uh, actually has shaped me. And uh, there is a picture I'm specifically looking for. Now that I'm looking for, it's obviously not there. <laughs> that, see, yeah, there's one now. thing that some people obviously also don't know about you, Dr. Vasi, is that all of us, and I get this a lot, it's just some talk, specifically when we read our radiology reports to our patients, they know as much as we do. They say, this is gibberish. What does that mean? And then I get to recall, I say, remember all of this stuff you're learning in gibberish? Yeah, this is actually English. Dr. Abbasi actually speaks this in several different languages and can actually explain this in all the, you know, that itself blows my mind because I look at this and I go, oh, Medicine is a whole different language. That is my second language. And I feel confident in saying that because you got to break down some of those words or you got to Google them. That's that's to put it lightly. And this man knows it in several different languages. Like that's over my head. Like I couldn't even imagine, let alone when you tell me that, you know, you come from this past without parents that have the literacy. And then that alone says, holy buckets, this man learned it on his own in several different languages. And I just like, you know, I think I'm gonna go take a nap after this because I'm exhausted. Like I can't even fathom that. 